If you have your Bibles with you this morning, we ask to turn to Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2. Um, continue to pray for all our missionaries and the situation uh, that we find a lot of our church brethren in. They're not able to work. Continue to pray for that as well. Hebrews chapter 2, the first verse, the Bible says, Therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. For if the words spoken by the angels were steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord, and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him? God also bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders and with divers miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost, according to his own will. For unto the angels have he put in subjection the world to come, wherefore we speak. But one, uh, but one in a certain place testified, saying, What is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that thou, that thou visitest him? Thou madest him a little lower than the angels. Thou crowdest him with glory and honor, and didst set him over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet, for, for in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. But now we see not yet all things put under him. But we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. For if it became, for if it became him, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, and bringing many sons into glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. For both he that sat, sat for both for both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one. For which cause he is not ashamed to say uh, them to ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare thy name unto the breath, unto my brethren. In the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. And again I will put my trust in him. And again behold the children which God had given me. Dear Lord, we thank you and praise you for a good building to meet in uh, this morning. Lord, we thank you for the ones that's come out that we might feast in on thy word once again this side of eternity. Lord God, we pray that you'd come in a great way, that you'd send the Holy Ghost in this house and that you would fill it and that we would understand and know that we certainly met with thee. Honor thy word as you have promised and we ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, uh, kind of lengthy reading more than I usually do, but I felt like it was necessary to get uh, the full thought. And what we're going to be preaching about is trust. In, ver in verse 13, he says, And again, I will put my trust in him. Now, we'll get there a little bit later, but he says again. Uh, you know, I think putting your trust in Christ is a new thing every day. Not saying revisiting salvation, but putting your trust in Christ is a new thing every day. Uh, you think about the corona that's just come up and all the junk that goes with that. You know what? It takes trust in God to get out and do what you're supposed to and just believe that His mercy will keep you from it. That's a type of trust. Every morning you have to get up and place some kind of trust on the person of Christ. And so we as the Lord's people, uh, sometimes we don't uh, do that like we should. Now, I personally believe the Hebrew letter to be written by Paul like the others, although it never says. And I believe a lot of people think it's to the Jews. I do not think it's to the Jews. I think it was to the church at Jerusalem. It was not for their whole, uh, for their whole. just because you were a Jew, just because you were a family kin, it did not mean it was for you. It was just like the Philippian letter was for the church at Philippi. 
this letter was to the church, the first church, and one that made a lot of local mistakes. And they were always under the impression and under the desire to bring the law back into the church age. And again and again and again they were re rebuked for it. So he says, therefore we ought to give the more, more earnest heed to these things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. Now, I want you to see the first thing that the writer points out is that if we're not very careful, we can let some things slip. Now, everybody in this room uh, uh, are Baptist people, and we've been Baptist people for a long time, but I know the bulk majority of us meeting in this room didn't always understand the doctrines of grace. And why didn't we understand the doctrines of grace? Somewhere back yonder in the heritage of Bumpus Mills Church, somebody had let them slip. And if you let them slip and you let them go the least little bit, they'll be forgotten very soon because that's the nature of the flesh is. Right. And, right. and so we find then that these people, he was saying, listen, Jerusalem church, you've let some things slip and you need to pay attention. So he says in verse 2, For if God, uh, for if the word spoken by the angels was steadfast, in other words, it was immovable, you couldn't change it. You know what? The word of God says what it says, it means what it says, and we can't change it in any way. If we change it, uh, then, uh, uh, then it's no longer the word of God. For if, by the, for if the word spoken by the angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just or a, a correct or a legal recompense of reward. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? Now, apparently the issue was they were saying something wrong about salvation. He said, because he begins with saying, don't let it slip. And he says, we listen to the law, and now you're neglecting a great salvation. Now, the salvation that the Jews were neglecting was salvation by grace and grace alone. Mm -hmm. They were very desirous to bring works back into it. And if you don't believe that, you can remember this, that Paul said concerning Peter, I rebuke him to his face. And so their desire was to bring works back into the situation, and, and Paul was rebuking them for it. Verse 4, God also bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders and with diverse miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost, according to his own will. Now, I want you to notice two things there. The first one saying that the Holy Ghost is a gift, and it, it's one of the recommend, recognizable things that follow salvation. Um, if, if you don't understand the Holy Ghost, I'd sincerely call, make my calling and election sure. Mm -hmm. Because that's the means by where you learn Christ. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have that, uh, I, I would dare say that you don't have anything at all. And, and so we find that in this situation, Paul reminds them of that and reminds them of apostolic gifts. Verse 5, for unto the angels he, uh, he not, for unto the angel had he not put in subjection the world to come whereof as we speak. In other words, he didn't expose them to what we've been exposed to. Verse 6, but one in a certain place testified, saying, What is a man if thou, that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man, that thou visiteth him? In other words, why did you possibly look on man in the way that you did? Why, why is man more meaningful than the next? He, he, you know, questioned why man is the way he is. Verse 9, Now we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. Now, I want you to notice two things. First of all, the Bible says he was being crowned with glory and honor. Uh, when he rose from the grave, he, was, he had defeated it all. 
It was all under his feet. The, the plan was complete, and he came out the victor. Uh, and again, he was reminding the church at Jerusalem, it's Jesus, it's Jesus, it's Jesus. Don't get your law metal back up in it. We just talked about a group up there, uh, up there in Kentucky, Madisonville, and uh, uh, how they now are going so far to, to, to deny the deity of Christ. You know, why don't they open this up and understand and look at it? And you could get angry for a little bit, but you know what? There, but by the grace of God, go I. Uh, all I can do is rejoice and say, Thank you, Lord, for showing me this way. Verse 10. For it became him for whom are all things, by whom are all things, and bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. For both he sanctified, and they who are sanctified all are, are all of one. Now, did you get that? That means we are like unto Christ. He was sanctified, and we are sanctified. Now, uh, sanctified has really two different types of meanings you could look at. First of all, it means clean. You know what? I'm a pretty poor example of a Christian life, but you know what? This inward man is sanctified. It's clean. It's different than it was before. And it also means set apart for a purpose. Amen. The Lord Jesus Christ, he was set apart to be the sinless Son of God. He was set apart before we even understood what time was about to be the epitome of the sacrifice. He was set apart. And you know what? You're set apart for something. And if you don't, you know what? You know why I believe some people are so miserable today? They've not found that spot. Or if they have, they won't get in it. Hmm. And that will leave you in a very miserable condition to spend, to spend whatever days God has granted you here on earth. That would, that would be a situation most miserable. Then he says in verse 12, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. In other words, these people who were sanctified, Paul was saying, my purpose is to praise the Lord. My purpose is to preach. And, and your purpose is to sing. They were carrying out what the Lord had given them to do. And he reminded the church of Jerusalem to, to continue with that. Then verse 13, and again, another day, another time, another morning, another day, and again, and again, and again, and again. You know what? I've been sincerely trying to serve the Lord for over 30 years uh, now, and, and I, I find myself almost every day getting up and again, and again, and again. Because you know what rises up? My flesh rises up too. Yeah, right. And that's a big issue. And so Paul was saying, listen, yeah, you're messing up, but this is a new day. It, it, it's a new yeah. time. Yeah. The, church, the church of Jerusalem was going awry. But he says, hey, with the help of God, you can go back to where you were, saying, uh, and again, I will put my trust in him. Now I ask you, this morning, what do you trust Christ with? What, what, what have you placed in his hands, in his being, and, and what he's able to do? Uh, many of us here have been saved, and, and we say we've placed our, our, our soul in his trust. You know what? That's a miraculous thing. You know what? The, the, your inward soul, your never dying man, that's all you have. Uh, I don't care if you're rich or poor or have uh, uh, zeros all the way down the road in your bank account and you're driving this and driving that when it's all over. And believe me, I know because I've seen so many people die when it's all said and done, all you have is your soul. Amen. That's it. Yep. And so I would say, 
if you're saved, you put your soul's trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. But then, why don't we put our life in his trust? Why don't we put the lives of our children into his trust? See, and it never ceases to amaze me that, that we'll, we'll place the most precious thing that we could ever hold within these hands and place it into Jesus. You know, that, that's the big thing with Armenianism <clears throat> is they've never really trusted Christ at all. Because if you have, you'd recognize how precious your soul is. Yeah. Well, listen, that's something to be protective of. Place, it, place the trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. So we find if we're saved, we've done that, but a lot of times we'll pull back just a little bit. Now I want you to go way back with me to the book of Deuteronomy. Uh, Deuteronomy uh, chapter 28. And it's really the first mention of trust in the Bible. And I thought it was uh, very curious that it was in the sermon that Moses was addressing to Israel just before his dying. And in this sermon, he also predicts very clearly those leaving the faith. And he even predicts the judgment down in Egypt. And, and very specific, and the Lord moved him in a great way. So in Deuteronomy 28, verse 52, Deuteronomy 28 and verse 52, Moses speaking, and he shall besiege thee because of their sin, because of their rebellion, and he shall besiege thee in all thy gates until thy high fenced wall shall come, and come down wherein thou trustest. So we find that one thing that we're very, very easy to trust is this world. Now they had gated the city and they had went exactly by the Lord's direction. This was going to be out in the future from Moses' day. But they, they, they built Jerusalem in specification as God had given them. And it had a gate. And it had, it had multiple gates. And it, and it had a high wall. And they began to trust in them. Yeah. You know, uh, uh, today, we're very much the same way. We trust on things that's around us. If you ask most people, where do you go to church? And you say, well, New Testament Baptist in Dover. Where is that? Mm -hmm. And you know why? They, they equate this to the church. And, 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 and they trust in this. You know what? Uh, I'm on this thing because I, I like old buildings and it, it, it's uh, something like uh, buildings across Tennessee and it has all kinds of pictures of old houses and, and church buildings and schools and, and different stages of decay and they will identify this and I saw one the other day Independent Missionary Baptist Church and, and the building was caving in and, and it was just about gone. Listen, that's you know, you know, I wonder sometimes if they quit and they're gone because that's what they were trusting in. See, it may be that we one day are not able to meet here, but that don't mean New Testament Baptist Church is gone because I hope that you trust in the fact that this is the people, that this is the church. God gave us a good building, but listen, it has nothing to do with the church. And, and, and so uh, we see Israel's mess up and, and that they play with placing their trust in God. And, and very much today, I think we're, we're the, in the same group. If we're not very careful, we quit placing our trust in God and start placing our trust in things, in houses, in lands, in the government. Listen, the Democratic Party through this mess of corona, what they want you to think is you're dependent on them. Mm -hmm. Not so. Uh, I trust in God. 
And that's what, that, that's certainly what that we ought to do as well. Simply trust in God, follow his word, and let the chips fall where they may. And so we find that trust has, has uh, always been an issue for God's people. Now, uh, in a, a little... I'm going to go to the book of Ruth. Ruth chapter number 2. And uh, we're going to... Ruth 2. And we're going to begin reading in verse 11. Uh, the book of Ruth chapter number 2, verse 11. The Bible says, And Boaz answered and said unto her, it hath fully been shewed me all that thou hast done unto thy mother-in-law since the death of thine husband. Now, I want you to see that your testimony is going to get around. And uh, if you remember, I'm not too big on Naomi. I, I love the name. My little grandbaby, one of them is named Na uh, Naomi, the, the middle name. And uh, I, But you know what? Naomi was a rebel. Ruth was the good one. Remember, remember what Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Morpah and Ruth. He, she said, y'all stay here. Y'all live the heathen life, get involved with the heathen people, and let me go back to my people. And Ruth just begged her. Oh, and, and you know, Orpah, which is who Oprah Winfrey is named after of, she went back like a scotty dog. Mm -hmm. And, and, and Ruth begged to be, to just let me go with you. Let, let me be, my people will be thine people. And, and, and somehow, and it always does, and your testimony will do the same thing, somehow this testimony had got back to Boaz. And Boaz would be her comforter. And so, reading in the, verse of the, the rest of verse 11, and uh, second part, and how thou hast left thy father and thy mother and are come unto a people which thou knewest not hitherto. The Lord recompense thy work or give you uh, a return on it, give you, the, give you the pay for it. The Lord recompense thy work and a full reward be given to thee of the Lord God of Israel under whose wings thou hast come to trust. See, this heathen woman named Ruth had more about to trust than the people of Israel under his wings. You know, what a wonderful place to abide this morning. Uh, what, what a wonderful thing out of the storms and uh, the mess that's going on in this world just to be under the wings of the Lord Jesus Christ and, and just enjoying the view under his wing. And you know what? When she started trusting, she would work all day with enough to make one cake of, fly, of food at night, but she was still trusting God. See, where is your trust? When the barrel goes empty, where does your trust lie? There's not one of us in this building this morning that don't have plenty of food at the house. But what about when the barrel runs dry? See, um, Ruth was the type of woman that trusted God. And she was a heathen. And so certainly we as Gentiles as well, we, the ability to trust God is within us we just have to do it. Uh, Psalms chapter 5. Psalms chapter 5. And verse 11. <clears throat> Psalms 5 verse 11. The Bible says, But let all those that put their trust in thee rejoice. Let all those that put their trust in thee Rejoice. So only thing I can come in here come up with is we come when we come in here with well, uh, it, man, it's a dark day. Uh, I don't know what we're gonna do, where are we being, what we're we gonna do. They're not putting their trust in Christ. Because it says here, if you do, you'll be joyful. 
you'll be happy and glad. Listen, what's the worst thing that could happen? That you die and you go out into eternity to be with the Lord Jesus Christ? Hey, that's good news. You know, that that would be a wonderful thing, even today, if we went out and be to be with the Lord Jesus Christ. Where is your trust? Where's the trust at? And, and so we, we see then as the Lord's people, day by day, our trust ought to be growing in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ or to be advancing. But many times what I see today is the opposite. Uh, opposite. But let those that put their trust in thee rejoice. Let them shout with joy because why? Thou defendest them. Now, from what I take from that then, there won't, it's not a situation where there won't be attacks, but when the attacks come, it's going to defend you. It, it, isn't that a wonderful thing? It, isn't that a marvelous thing? That if you trust the Lord God of heaven, he will defend you. He, whatever the problem, and if you remember, when they go up against a great city, he would number, and they would send the very few. Uh, you know, one time they were Gideon was going to take a bunch up, and he said Gideon got too much, and then he says, you know what, Gideon, you still have too much. And, and they sent them down there to the brook, and those that would drink like this, they chew them off, and the ones that laugh like a dog, he said, then the one you want. Got down to 300 people, and you know what? Gideon went straight on, and he trusted God. But, if you know the background of Gideon, it didn't start out that way, did it? No. He had to have his little dude doing this, and his and his dew drop what's doing that. And you know what? Uh, uh, Jared, you preach that some what to do with the dew drops. And that's exactly what Gideon was wanting. He wanted things a certain way. But you know what? I have to come to this. He learned to trust God. Yeah. He learned to trust God because when he was down there getting the people that, that drink water like a dog, he, he, he said, this is the ones and he went out with God. So experiential things will cause you to trust God more and more as the years go by. One more place in the Old Testament in Jeremiah chapter 7. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 7 in the very first verse. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 7 in the first verse, the Bible says, The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, Stand in the gate of the Lord's house, and proclaim this word, and say, Hear the word of the Lord, all ye of Judea, of Judah, excuse me, that, in, that enter into these gates to worship the Lord. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Amend your ways and your doings, and I will cause thee, I will cause you to dwell in the place. Trust you not in the lying words saying, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. Now, you know, it's important when the Bible says something one time, but when it says, don't you trust in the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, three things, three times in the very same verse, he said, and you know why he was reminding them? They were. They were trusting in religion. What did they do down at the, the temple of the Lord? They sacrificed and they, they had their meat offerings and their, and their wave offerings and their incense and all that went with it. And over the years, what had happened, they'd forgotten the God that was behind all that and they were worshiping the little doodads that they were doing. Kind of sounds like the Catholics, don't it? And so he said... Trust in the Lord. What we need to do is limit, remove our trust from religion and place our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Place our trust in who he is emphatically. So, uh, so trust ye not in the lying words saying the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, and these 
For if you thoroughly amend your ways and your duties and thoroughly execute judgments between a man and his neighbor, be careful what you trust in. You know, uh, I think there's a lot of people out there trusting the wrong thing, don't you? I know a lot of people that are trusting the sinner's prayer. You know what? I don't trust that, do you? It's like a toothpick. You, you know why I believe the sinner's prayer is like a toothpick? It's because it's all about you and nothing about him. Be careful of that. Trust in Christ. Trust not when you came to him, but when he came to you. Trust that. Uh, put your confidence in your faith in him and him alone. And the Lord, the Lord will serve. The Lord will be uh, a mighty help and a wonderful, a wonderful friend to you if we simply trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now go with me to 2 Corinthians in the New Testament, and I want you to see that this theme crosses over. It's not just for the Old Testament people, uh, it's for us as well. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, and we're going to begin reading in verse 7. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning in verse 7, Paul uh, writing to Corinthians the second time around, and as you know, the, the first letter had been pretty plain, and it laid out the problems that the church was having. And more than just laying out the problems that the church was having, it laid out how they needed to be addressed. And, and so with that in mind, the second time around, apparently they had done much of what Paul had recommended that they do. Apparently they had uh, followed through with much of the stuff that he said, listen, this needs to be addressed. So in verse 7 it says... And our hope of you is steadfast, knowing that as you are partakers of the suffering, shall you be also of the consolation. Now, he went from grave concern for them to being to the point, he says, uh, my confidence is steadfast in you. And, and how did he measure it? That's the end of the verse. He says, through the problems you've suffered. See, long as we're going around and going along with the world, there's no guarantee we will stand up when trials come. But when the Corinthian church kind of changed their tactics, apparently uh, when they threw that man who was married to his stepmother out of the church, there was repercussions for that. And they started suffering a little bit. And he says, hey, that's going to be all right. If you, that is part of doing things in the proper way. If you don't have any hiccups along the way, something's probably wrong. Verse 8, for we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble. Now, you know, when you get a missionary letter and everything is healthy and well, then you know what? You, you, you don't even think to pray for them. Now, in this letter that we got from the crafts even this week, listen, little Sarah down there in Mexico, her health is not good. And the next time you think of Sarah, you get on your knees and you pray that she might be sustained and that the Lord might help her in the situation she's in. See, uh, that's a hiccup. And, and listen, it's, to me, it's a lot more than a hiccup. When, when you have your children in a bad situation, it cuts you to the core. Adam will be 30 in three months. And you know what? Uh, I don't feel anything different uh, from the day he was born. When he's suffering, I'm suffering. And the very, the very same thing, that's how the Lord feels about us. When... Uh, he, he, he will be a sufficient, uh, ever-present help if you trust him. Verse 8. For we, would not, for we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble which came in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure, <laughs> above strength, and so much 
we despaired even to life. Now notice what he says. He says, we were pressed out of measure. You know what? There's not one person in this building that's been pressed out of measure. You may, may, may have been made fun of a little bit. You may have had to take a little uh, name calling, but most of us haven't done that. You know why you're not made fun of more than you are? It's because what you're doing is in here and not out there. You ain't going to be made fun in here because we all believe the same, right? But if you get out there, you may have a few hiccups along the way. So Paul was out evangelizing. He was out preaching the gospel in places it had never been heard of before. And the results wasn't helping wealth, but he was, he was put in a situation that the Bible says here um, that... Uh, uh, it caused problems it, it, it was with his health now verse 9 but we had the sentence of death in ourselves that we should not trust in ourselves but in God which raiseth the dead now I want you to see what he says but we had the sentence of death in ourselves now Paul was sentenced to death not not here, but you know what? This morning you're sentenced to death. The judge's hammer's done, done falling down, and you are sentenced to the lake of fire. But it is a blessed, wonderful thing when God intervenes. When he says, it doesn't have to be so for this one. Then he's mine, she's mine, she belongs to me. And so Paul's saying, listen, I, I was done judged. I, I, I was done as good as dead. I, I, I was done in a situation where there was no hope to be found. And notice what it says. But we had the sense of death in ourselves that we should not trust in ourselves. Now, it never ceases to amaze me, these people that are works for salvation, how they trust in their self. Because you know what? They're not cut from any different cloth than I am. The only thing is different I may admit that, I, that I'm just simply a sinner saved by grace and they think that they're uh, going to something and progressing somehow. You know what? If anything, you should, I, I've learned this. If anything, you should get hold of it, over it and Christian walk, you regress instead of progress. Your, your flesh gets weak as you go along the way. Right. And, 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 and so we find then, Paul says, I'm not trusting in that. I'm trusting in the Lord. I'm not trusting in what this can do. Because you know what? Paul understood the capability of this. He had encouraged the arrest and the assassination of the church. And he knew what the flesh was capable of. He said, listen, I'm not going to put my trust in that. I'm not going to put my trust in something this thing has done. And we find more and more people as the days go by that that's really what they're doing is putting trust in self. Then he says, but in God which raiseth the dead. Now, that, that's a two thing street. Number one, and, and again, it always, and I'm the same way, I'm throwing myself in the bucket. But how we can believe God the Almighty can save a sinner's soul and not believe he can't raise the dead literally. You know what? He can still do that. Your average Baptist today asks, oh, that was an apostolic gift. I'd like to know where they got that. I don't see it in the Word of God. You know what the problem is? We lack trust. That's the problem. We, we lack uh, putting uh, our trust in things that we can perceive and see, but what we need is to look in a spiritual eye and be able to trust. Just, just trust God. Just trust the Lord Jesus Christ. Just trust the Holy Ghost that, that, that they are able to do all that they promised to do. Put your trust in Him. So with that said, now we'll read verse 10. Who delivered us from so great a death and doth deliver us in whom we trust and will, that he will yet deliver us. He says, he's delivered me from death. I'm not facing the charge of sin and death. And you know what? If he won't 
promise to him, he'll deliver me now from the mess I'm in here. Isn't that a wonderful, wonderful thing? You know what? Uh, yeah, you just ever get hungry for deliverance? I do. Uh, you know, if, if, it's, if I'm not real careful in the flesh, I'll ask to be moved to a higher point. But you know what? You've got to remember this. That's not yours to ask. Because he said, I've appointed you a time. And that time is coming. But until then, occupy till I come. Uh. And don't hope for the day to be turned loose. That's coming. But in the interim, put your trust. Whatever it is, if, if, if you get laid off, if, you, if your house burns to the ground, whatever happens, put your trust in Him. Because when it's all said and done, you don't have anything other to do. You know, a lot of times you think about, well, you know, I'm a nurse that always needs nurses, blah, 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 blah. Heard that ever since I became a nurse. But you know what? What I need to realize is I put my trust in God. That's far, that's far better than trusting in your occupation. Put your trust in God. Lastly, I'll say this. Those of you that are lost, put your trust in God. Amen. Put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. You throw everything on Him. You know, uh, we talked about the story of Naomi and Ruth. And it says in the Bible that, that Ruth wouldn't turn Naomi loose. She just held to her. And finally, you know what? We need to do that, don't we? We just need to hang on with everything we've got. And you see, they went back. <laughs> and you know, they, this is the best thing. You study in the lineage of Christ. And there's Ruth. And Ruth the Moabites. See, we just need to trust Him. That's all we need to do. Put our faith.